getting you ready. Pray that all is well with you. All is well with me, except that we're still nursing uh, what is a, a, a marathon, if you will, of a cold, mainly because of so many activities that we have been involved in, just having the, had, had the opportunity to rest it out. However, we're continuing to, um, uh, to preach the Word of God. The Bible says that in uh, your weakness is God's strength made perfect. So let's call this a perfect day. All right, here's what I want to do today. I was talking to Elder Smith the other day, and he was saying to me about he's now beginning to understand the power of the elect. Especially since we, we gave what was that un, un, unprecedented, um, the, the holy grail of explaining uh, the elect of Peter getting out of the boat and walking on the water and, and sinking in Jesus, rescuing him of those, all of those fears that, um, uh, that one would have rather than saying, I'm going to be one of the elect, I'm going to be one that's going to live to see the return, <clears throat> the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> pardon me that I will not taste of death. And what he explained to me that, well, the, he's beginning to understand it a lot more because they say it's not a new phenomenon in terms of biblical prophecy. It's always been there. It's just something that very few people have, have taught the Southern Baptists, and we'll give them credit for at least appreciating the, the, uh, the tribulation have taught rather than the elect. They have laid heavy emphasis on uh, the rapture. If you are Southern Baptist, uh, then you know how much the, the emphasis that they have laid on the teaching of the rapture rather than the, the, the elect. Actually, the procedures are these. Uh, the elect, uh, the, the, the tribulation comes first, and then after the tribulation, then does Jesus appear. And then the 1,000 year reign of peace, uh, and within that process, the rapture potentially could take place. But absolutely stomp down, stomp, stomp down, boom shakalaka sure that the rapture does not happen before the tribulation. In fact, it's a slight of one's Christianity and, and favor before God to say that the Lord's going to take you out of the earth before the tribulation, such as the movie Left Behind and all the other false prophets that have prognosticated this over the years. But most people don't know about the elect. A lot of people know the, 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 the rapture, and there's less discussion biblically on the rapture than there is on the, the elect or the tribulation for that matter. So what I want to do today is just do a little bit of review. And as you very well may know, we're coming up on the uh, anniversary of the August 28th phenomenon out at the Staybridge Hotel out there at Eric Miller Territory in the Indianapolis, Indiana. We're coming up on a one year anniversary. That's a little bit down the road, but we'll be getting to it as soon as we possibly can. So what is it? What is the tribulation? Well, the tribulation explained by the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in Matthew's Gospel chapter 24 um, is, and, and, and the, pretty much the entire chapter but it's a phenomenon, it's a prophecy, it's an event that corresponds or correlates to or runs parallel to the creation process that we find in Genesis chapter 1 and in Genesis chapter 2, the first several verses of Genesis chapter 2, we have what is known as the creation. In the beginning, God spoke and said, let there be light. And it was so. And on, that was the first day, and the evening and the morning of that day was the first day God spoke. And then, of course, on the sixth day, we have the creation of man. Great teaching out of the book of Revelation on the sixth seal, open. And then on the seventh day, God rested. We find that in, in Genesis chapter 2. Well, the tribulation is the opposite of creation. The tribulation is when God destroys or destructs everything that he created in the first six days of creation. And on the seventh day, he rested. And so the tribulation is a unique prophecy given by the Lord Jesus Christ only, not by Moses, not by Samuel, not by Daniel, not by Haggai, not by Noah, not by Obadiah. But the tribulation is a singular prophecy that Jesus himself has given and, and perhaps, not perhaps, but surely 
that he's the only one with the authority to speak the tribulation. Now think about the tribulation if you are aware of it, and many Southern Baptists are aware of the tribulation, that the tribulation is of such consequence that no man could speak it, quite frankly. I, I, and, and all the things that God can do, and I'm certainly not going to limit God to anything that he cannot do, but all the things that man can do, <clears throat> man may not be credible when it comes to speaking the tribulation. Let me tell you why. <clears throat> I mean, man can speak to, to another man's body and prophesy, and he be healed. Praise Almighty God. His eyes can be opened and he can, he can see he can be healed of cancer. And in the name of Jesus, be thou healed. But not in, his name, not in the man's name, not in the prophet's name, not in the preacher's name, not in the servant's name, but only in the name of Jesus. And man can speak. <clears throat> and a number of things can happen. But no man can speak the tribulation. Now Noah did call for the flood but he did not speak it. The tribulation is a series of events, mainly wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, famines, and earthquakes in diverse places. Only God himself could do that. The same as man cannot speak creation. Man cannot speak and say, let there, let there be light. Man cannot speak and say, let there be the, the, the firmaments and the separation of the waters and the firmaments. Man cannot speak and say, and let the oceans and streams be filled with fish. And man cannot speak and let there be fowl. Man does not have that potential or that power. But only God can. And so, hence, those of you who are up on studying the tribulation will understand why only Jesus spoke it, that Moses never spoke it, not even John the baptizer, nor Peter or John the revelator, who did speak some pretty profound things. John did. But he said he witnessed them. He didn't speak them into existence. So what do we have? So we have this phenomena where God closes the book. The, the tribulation, the creation, let's look at this. The creation is the front cover of the book, right? This is the cover, kiva to kiva, right? This is the front cover of my Bible, right? The creation, Genesis chapter 1 and part of Genesis chapter 2, is the front cover of the book of life, of the book of the world, of the book. The, the tribulation is the back cover of the book. You see what I'm saying? The tribulation is the back cover of the book. And then in between that, you got all of this. You got Genesis to Revelation. In between that, you got all of this. Whole lot of stuff going on up in here. You got the Psalms, you got the Proverbs, and you even got my notes. <laughs> you didn't find that funny. Okay, it's all right. Y'all have to laugh at my jokes. I really don't care. You know, you got Jesus in here. You got John the Baptist. You got Paul the Apostle. You got Jonah in the well. All of that. Let's start all over again, right? So the creation part is the front part of the book, right? The, the creation, God said, let there be light. That's the front part of the book, right? The, the tribulation is the back of the book. And by the way, the end of the book. This is, so you would name this the tribulation. You would name this the creation. And then everything in between. You got Sarah in here, got Jacob in here, got Joseph and got, you know, Zaphnap, Peonah in there and all that, got Isaiah and all these, you know, got Daniel, she got Nebuchadnezzar hanging around up in here, right? And then you got Paul, you got Thomas wanting to stick his hands in the, in the nail prints of Jesus, you got Mary Magdalene, you got Lazarus dying and being raised again, right? You got the Corinthian people over there doing all kinds of crazy stuff up there in Greece and Corinth. Paul had to straighten them out. Got Paul being let down on a basket over the wall in Ephesus after a riot broke out. They wanted to kill him. All that's in between the creation and the tribulation. The creation, the tribulation. You got it? All right. So what does that mean? All right, well, what, what we're trying to express to you is that what happens here 
in the tribulation as, as prophesied by Jesus only in the tribulation, almighty God, his name is Jesus. He comes and he selects a group of people to live through the tribulation because the tribulation is a process of destroying all life, all persons living at the period of time when the tribulation begins will be destroyed except for a small group of people called the elect. Now Jesus talks about this or teaches about it in Matthew's gospel, chapter 24, where he brings sort of a middle ground to the teaching on the tribulation. He says, and except those days should be shortened, the days of the tribulation, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect, and there you are, the elects, and that's the group of people that will not be known as Jews or Christians, they will be known as the elect. Now this is not taught widely in the churches, and it was not meant to be taught widely in the churches. What the churches erroneously did, mainly Southern Baptists, and I'll even give them some Southern Baptists some credit, what the Southern Baptists erroneously taught was the rapture, which is completely removed from all of this in a larger sense, found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. They erroneously taught the rapture preceding the tribulation. It was an error, but it was a planned error by Satan who planned it to teach people to think that somehow or another they would not go through the tribulation, but that it, it, is, it is absolutely creation dynamics. Is it, it is, it is, it, it, the physics of the, of the teaching of the rapture is impossible. It, you, you, you cannot, you cannot get water from dry sand. You can't do it. Oh, well, let's say for a miracle. So erroneously, the, the, the rapture was taught. We we'll, won't spend a lot of time on that because most people now listen to me now understand that process that the rapture uh, of, of, uh, as a state of, 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 of spirituality is not a mistake, but where they have placed the event of the rapture. You know, the, the Southern Baptists who taught that the rapture takes place before the tribulation will be tantamount. That, that's a fancy word for saying parallel to or like unto Jesus walking on the water before he was born in Bethlehem. It just doesn't happen that way. Jesus is going to walk on the water to be absolutely sure, but he's first got to be born in Bethlehem. When, when, when the Southern Baptists taught that the rapture would take place before the tribulation would be tantamount to saying that Jesus would be crucified on the cross before he was born in Bethlehem. It doesn't make any sense. Both of those events are significant events in the life and times of Jesus, but one must take place first, and you can't get them in, and misorder them. You can't erroneously teach them out of order, and that's exactly what the Southern Baptists did on the matter of the rapture rather than understanding the process of the tribulation and then the elect. So I think it's important that we at least try to explain to people who the elect is. And the reason why this is not taught widely in the churches, it, 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 because it, it, I, I, I would give several reasons, but I would suspect that the main reason for it is that God has not released this to the churches. In fact, this is not a church teaching. What do you mean by that? Well, what I, I mean by, by that was that during the, day, <clears throat> during the days of Samuel and Eli, in the period of the tabernacle at Shiloh, you would not have been teaching Jesus on the cross. I mean, Eli or Samuel would not have gotten up when the tabernacle was out in, in, at, uh, in Shiloh and started teaching Jesus on the cross. That would have been, it would have been out of, not that it wasn't going to take place, it would have been out of the sync of things of God's plan from creation to the tribulation. But once the tabernacle and the temple was torn down, the teaching of the cross became the most eminent teaching as we find in as, as the first thing that Jesus does in teaching the tribulation is that he tears down the temple. Not one stone will be left upon another. 
But now, so what happens is this. What do I mean that the elect is not a, a church teaching? Because first, the church itself has to been, then become a, a, an, op or an organization that no longer is the chariot of God. The church is no longer the chariot of God. That that age is closed. And now that the, ch the church age has closed, the elect age is open. So as Eli or Samuel would not have been teaching about Jesus on the cross in Shiloh at the tabernacle there in Shiloh, it would probably have been very unseemly for anyone to be teaching about the elect except for prophecy during the age when the church age was authentic. It has now been closed. Now, I had my engineer draw several designs for us a week or so ago in our teaching. And I wanted to pull up those designs so we can again give you a graphic visual of the ages that have come and that have gone and the age that we're presently in. So you can at least get a visual on that. And my purpose today is to at least do some review on these prophecies to help you get, come to terms with the fact well, why, uh, why the tribulation? Why the elect? Why the scripture of some here that will not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom? So the visual we have here on the screen at present is that we have the time in this segment of the Adam and Eve. We know that segment very well. It runs for about four chapters. And then, of course, we got the segment after that in chapters starting in chapter 6, with with Noah, and from Noah we get uh, Terah, and from Terah we get Abraham, and from Abraham we get the Jews. And the Jews carry on a large segment of the Bible, and in fact the main body of the Bible is that segment. And then after that segment, Jesus is born, and we get the Christian and the Jews, and that becomes all pretty much all one segment the Jews and the Christians. Jesus was born a Jew. He was not born a Christian. He was born a Jew. Jesus was not born some other race or he was born a Jew. And that needs to be absolutely stomped down clear. His lineage has been traced all the way back to Adam, if you look in the book of Luke. And then we, after the, after the Christian or the church age closes, now, we'll note that God closed the gate to the, to the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, verse 23, I think it was. And they could not go back into that garden again. <coughs> that age was closed. That age was closed. They could not go back into the garden. Pardon me, Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. So he drove man out of the garden, evangelist, uh, sacrifice and placed them on the east of the garden and uh, of uh, Eden with cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So they could not go, God closed that. So Mr. Engineer, bring up again the diagram, and it doesn't matter which one you bring up now, but that's a, yeah, bring that one up. And so once the gate was closed to Adam and Eve going back into the garden, we now have the period of the Jews and the Christians of Shep, Shem and Japheth. And once that age is closed, at the, at the bottom there with Japheth, the age of the elect is open. But you can't go back into either one of those. You would not go back into a Jewish temple now looking for salvation. You would not do that. And, and Jesus tore down the temple as the most important significance of the closing of the Jewish age. Now the church age is closed. And we're in the period now, now known as the elect which is the age of the Hamites and the Canaanites. And so we wanted to be able to bring up these three movements of God, the perfect, the Trinity of God. We wanted to be able to bring this up to let you get, get a close look at that. And Mr. Engineer, Engineer, let that stay up there for just a moment so people can understand something about the, 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 the move of God and why we're in the period now known as the elect or we're headed towards that period, or the group of people known as the elect. First, the group of people is the Adam and Eve group. And then, of course, um, 
You know, a lot of people like to challenge me. Well, who did Cain marry? Um, talking about Adam and Eve, right? Who, who, did, who did Cain marry and who did Cain's children marry? They married their sisters and their brothers, you idiot. Well, ain't that wrong? Ain't that incest? It wasn't wrong until God pronounced it as wrong on Mount Sinai, you idiot. Anyway, um, and of course, you know, Noah, uh, not Noah, but Lot had sexual intercourse with his two daughters, and God cursed them too. Moab and Amnon were the sons born of that licentious, incestual rather, relationship. But yeah, Cain married his sister. When you're trying to, trying to find some special people that were not around, no, Cain married his sister. That's right. I got something even, I got something even better for you. Adam married a part of his own body, you idiot, you. God took the, a, a rib from Adam and made it a beautiful woman. And he married that. Now what you gonna say about that? You know, some of these people always asking these questions, always trying to make the Bible, you know, trying to throw you in some sort of a tizzy about trying to find some mistake within the Bible. It's what they're always looking. It's what they're doing. That's why I call them idiots. All right, so let's go back to the other item of teaching that we're teaching today with respect to the fact that we've moved into the period now of the elect. The church age is closed. People find that very hard to believe. Listen. You know, a lot of people find it hard to believe that the Jewish age, a lot of Jews find it hard to believe that the Jewish age has closed, but it has. And, and so be it. And, and, and Jesus is soon to return. So we wanted to be able to do that. We want to explain the prophecy of the tribulation. And, uh, and we're presently in the tribulation right now. We're in a, a mode of period of time known as the tribulation. It is a time in which a massive destruction is coming. However, I've looked at this thing very succinctly and I've heard about the tribulation. I've taught about it for about for 35 years. I've heard about it. I'm willing now to believe that the tribulation itself as a totality of completion will be a seven-day event. That the tribulation itself will be a corresponding, not seven years or three and a half years, but it will be a corresponding to the creation event, which was a seven-day event. I mean, seven actual calendar, 24-hour calendar days. The tribulation. We're, well, you say, well, I thought you said we were in the tribulation last year. We are. But the actual strength of it itself in the process will, will happen in a period within a seven day period. But we're in the, the precipice of it, we are in the, 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 the outer edges of it, the, um, the, the, the outer the, the realm of it. You can say all kinds of things. The uh, event horizon, if you want to get into astrophysics. Yeah, we are. There's no doubt about it. <clears throat> when you look at, when you look at creation itself, God set the limits of creation when he spoke to the oceans and he spoke uh, to, the, to the eagles and to all the animals. God set the limit of creation. Now, we know that a number of people are talking about various kinds of global scientific dynamics, which were many call global warming or other kinds of things that they were to. But the, the, the limits have been set. Now, listen to this very carefully because I got to go. And you probably have to go someplace as well. But the limits of creation was set. Now remember, here's my book again, right? Remember, this is the, the front cover of the book. It's called Creation, right? This is the front cover of the book, right? This is the back cover of the book. It's called The Tribulation, right? And then everything that happened from Adam and Eve, including my notes, I got a lot of notes in here. What is this? The Hebrews, right? 
all that stuff that went on back there with Joseph and uh, Potiphar's wife, right? All that stuff went on there with Jacob and um, his sons, Rachel and everybody. All that is in between the two covers. You got it? So this is, this is the beginning. This is the creation. This is the front of the book. This is the tribulation. This is the back of the book. Now, you'll notice that the book, that the creation, Elder Smith, you'll notice that the back of the book is the same size as the front of the book. You got me? Turn it any way you want to turn it. Flip it over any way you want to. That the back of the book, and this is the back, this is the, the tribulation. This is the tribulation. The back of the book is the same size as the front of the book. You got me? Yeah. And so it would stand, it would stand to physics, mathematical reason, that the tribulation would only be seven days because what? The front of the book was only seven days, right? Elder Smith, are you out there? Sister Ruth Brown, virtuous reader. Hey, virtuous reader. Hey, virtuous. Virtuous, listen, if the front of the book is this size and dynamic, which is the creation, then it would stand to reason that the back of the book would be a book in, or it would be a copy of, or it'd be relative to, it would be similar to. In fact, it will be exact. So my prophecy some time ago, uh, Bennett, that the tribulation would only last seven days can be physically, can be mathematically explained by one would be, would, would cover the other, that you wouldn't need a longer period to destroy than you did to, to create. We'll talk more about that. But I think the thing that's important here for us today is that we come to terms and an understanding that the church age has closed. It's gone. It is. And I and I alone, well, I was, I, I was being a bit comical there. No, but the church age has, has, it, it, it has closed, my brother. And we're now in the tribulation. And the tribulation will be saved by the elect. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 22. Except those days be, it should not be shortened. Except for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. The days of the, the back end of the book. The back end of the book, which is a tribulation. The elect would be the reason why God will, will, will say it, will shorten those days. So we want to try to help people come to terms with that because it is a teaching, again, that it has not been taught widely in the churches. While I do give the Southern Baptist credos, kudos, or whoever, for teaching at least the tribulation, they are at least well up on the tribulation. They just got the rapture part of it wrong. But it's a teaching that only Jesus himself, and the reason why Moses never spoke about the tribulation in that regard, or any of the other major prophets never spoke about the tribulation, is because it would be like Moses trying to speak creation, like Moses trying to say, let there be light, let there be waters under the firmament. Moses didn't have that kind of power. He was powerful, but he didn't have that, didn't have that kind of power. And that's where this whole process, in, in terms of trying to help us come to some sort of a review. Let me wrap all this up today, and I'll come back with more about this because I think we need to try to reach a lot of people who have been deeply inculcated in the whole idea of the church age itself. But let me say that the Atla church, the word Atla was spoken, given to me back in September of 1991. And when God spoke that word Atla to me, no man, nor angel, or residents of heaven have ever had ever heard that word Atla until God spoke it unto me. It was it was never heard. Atla. 
Atla, Atla. Think about it for just a moment. Atla. Never heard before the sound, and and while the A T L A uh, can be alphabetically congruent with some other items of sounds, it isn't the sound that's produced with Atla, Atla. That's what God said. Now, what does that mean? Why am I emphasizing that? I'm emphasizing that because I'm emphasizing that because we are the elect. And what we'd like to be able to do in our review is to help those of you who have not come to terms with the fact you, you think the church age is still relevant and it's hard for you to make that leap. Well, think about how difficult it was for the Jews to make the leap that Jesus was talking or teaching about, but more specifically, how difficult it was for the Jews to make the leap into the church when Peter taught about the blood of Jesus, or the apostle Paul taught the blood of Jesus. Think how difficult it was for them, and many never made it. Still to this very day, the Jews don't make it into the church. Even though even now it is closed. Both the, both the temple and the church age, they have closed, but neither was entered into. Well, the Jews never entered into the church age. So when you find it difficult to believe that the church age is closed, do not find it unseemly that it has taken place. It has. And, and find yourself of the average, you know, person whose level of ability, spirituality, does not give you a view to understand the close of the church age or the, even understand the elect. And that's why I'm here teaching you. Pardon me for clearing my throat, but the Atla church is the church of the elect. You say, well, you know, I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor Manning. I mean, the church is a church and the church is this. And, you know, I understand. I, I know how difficult it is. But when you come to try to reckon with it, don't reckon with it within your particular strengths and intellectual under, or biblical understanding, a prophetic understanding. Try to reckon with it with the fact that the Jews could never understand how the Jewish age had closed and the church doors had been open, how difficult it was for them. And many of them were probably smarter than you, right? The, the difficulty they had. So understand and, and, and comfort yourself with the fact that you're having a difficult time believing that the Brooklyn Tabernacle or that Joel Osteen and the Lakewood Church or the Potter's House is still someplace relevant. You think that it is. It isn't. It isn't. I mean, I, it's, I'd say it, it just isn't. But remember, Jeremiah told the Jews in Judah that uh, God, now, even before the Jewish age closed, that, that God did not, Jehovah, he did not, Elohim, El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty, did not go to that temple anymore. He got so ticked off with those people that he just abandoned the temple. The phenomenon is called Ichabod. He left the temple. But you know that, right? But yet you cannot believe that he would do the same thing to the church. So I think when you comfort yourself by recognizing, Pastor Manning, I'm having a difficulty believe. I'm still going back. I'm still going back to Lakewood Church to next week and sit there and watch old grinning Joel Osteen grinning like a Cheshire cat. I'm going back to watch him because I believe that the church age is still open. I understand that. But you have to remember, if you look at the fact that a lot of Jews still go into the temple, but the Lord is not there. He just isn't there anymore. He isn't. But you can't tell them that. But you would tell them that. It, but, so I'm telling you, there's no point in going back to the potter's house or to Kenneth Copeland. We're in a critical stage now. And I'm, I'm really, with all my strength, reaching out to you to understand my brother. You need to pray that God will call you into the elect. And that's the other thing that we want to get to, that he is calling you through this ministry here in Harlem, New York City. He's calling you into the elect. And probably one of the things you say, well, you know, if he was calling me out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Dallas, you know, or maybe someplace down in Louisiana or Houston, I would believe God was using one of those cities. But Harlem, you got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me, Pastor Manny. Do you think that God, God's ever going to use Harlem to call anybody into anything? 
So I think if you pray about that, you might come away with a different perspective. All right, listen, I've got to wrap everything up here today. This is a bit of a news blog we do, looking at spiritual wickedness in high places for the most part, making uh, some observations about it and giving people a biblical foundation to the way of interpreting rather than have uh, uh, Sean Hannity or Laura Ingram or Janine Pirro or Anderson Cooper or Rachel Maydow or Don Lemon, uh, Rush Limbaugh interpret what's going on in the world. You come to me and I'll tell you based on what the word of God says. They'll just give you their worldly sinful view. But the man in the will tell you what God has said whether to say yea or nay, whether to go or to stay. You'll be led by the word of Almighty God. Come to the Manning Report on a daily basis to interpret the spiritual wickedness in high places because there's plenty of it that's going on. And so I am he, I'm the Lord, sir, James David Righteous Rebel Manning. And I'm here to serve you with news and information.